congratulations to winning the award for best music from the European Film Academy for the Steam Crusher. What does uh, this award mean to you? The award is an incredible honor and I have to say I was very surprised uh, when I got the news and I was surprised because I think a lot of people who see the movie because the movie is edited in a very fast way and um, we cut off the music midway in many many scenes and in other scenes it's very subtle or you might think it's a source track so I was actually very surprised that the jury recognized it as uh, being a work of, of score basically You know the scriptwriter and director Noah Fingscheid for quite some time since when and where? I met Nora uh, in the first year of our studies at the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg and um, well as it is in a film school there's a different way of, of getting to meet people of uh, having drinks in the evening of you know sort of um, forming friendships which later sometimes can be hard um, and yeah so basically we had a very personal way of working on her projects over the last eight or nine years a typical German film with a serious subject like that wouldn't have maybe score at all just because it has to be realistic here in Germany. So I was surprised that System Crasher has a film score. Why is there any music? I guess part of it is actually the long-term relationship with Nora Finkscheid. Um, it was obvious for both of us and, and to her that she wanted music in this film, even on her last movie. Without This World, uh, we worked on a score for, for her documentary. And I think in the final picture, there's about two and a half minutes of music in the end. But still, the music that I produced and recorded uh, for the movie was at least 40 minutes or something. So it's sort of, we like working together and she knows there's the option. And so we started out and Nora always had this Thing that she knew she wanted energy, she wanted emotion, she wanted something childlike and she wanted the movie to have sort of um, a fantastic dream uh, feel to it in some parts where and she said music would be uh, an important part in this. I don't think all everyone else in the project was totally on board with this from the beginning or they, they were like mm, we don't really know how much music is going to be in the movie, how much music are you actually going to produce and I said well I don't really know we're going to have to find out. Is music allowed to amplify feelings or does Nora Fingscheid see it as a manipulation of the audience? It's definitely there to amplify feelings. I don't think we've ever had a discussion where we were talking about manipulating the audience. She has been preparing uh, the shoot for years. How about the music? When did you start? Well, Nora worked on the script for several years, so um, she only sent it to me when it was as good as final, and there was one or two scenes that mentioned the use of music. Uh, I think one of the key scenes for me was that the educator, Micha, who forms a relationship with uh, Benny, um, he decides because none of the different e educational measures are helping Benny to take it to the woods for three weeks and when they get in his car he puts on this really loud electronic music and in the script it said it should be Goa and I actually had to, you know, me and Nora had to figure out what is Goa actually and I think the idea was just something that is kind of underground, fast, maybe hard to listen to because Benny actually shuts her ears when he puts on this loud music and her roughness is, uh, he's sort of a counterpart with his own uh, wildness and roughness to her and that is amplified or shown through the music he listens to. So we started on preparing this track and another track pl that plays in a cafe scene when Benny thinks she's moving back with her mother which is sort of an EDM pop track. Those were the two 
tracks that we composed for the shoot sometimes just the day before shooting we figured out what to do or finished it last minute and um, yeah those two tracks ended up being an important part in the whole score and sounds from there are used in the other keys as well System Crasher had its premiere at the Berlin Film Festival when did you finish the score? well uh, just let's say a week or two before the premiere, something like that. Um, you said music um, for the ride and the car coming from the radio. Um, why did you start with source music? There is um, source music from the car radio in the cafe. We have source music in the ice stadium from the TV. Is everything from you? No, um, there's. I think there's two source parts that are not composed by me, and the only two that are actually really relevant, as I said, is the cafe and, and the car. Um, actually, apart from these two pieces, there was another piece that I'm going to put on the soundtrack of System Crasher as a bonus track, which was sort of a more emotional song that I wrote Uh, emotionally to the script which didn't end up in the movie but sort of already set a certain mood that I was looking for uh, emotionally for, for this film In my notes uh, on the music I always um, deal with Benny's emotional state of mind freaks out, cheerful, sad, lonely how did Nora Finkscheid and you talk about the music for the film Nora's an incredibly precise director and I think as far as sound or orchestration goes um, she was open to all the ideas I had and as far as um, the position of the music was where could we have music I watched a lot of rough cuts also in the sound studio on a big screen with Nora together and sort of followed the development of, of the cut and yeah after each session we would say okay well the music you put in here is good or maybe we don't need that so Nora was also always thinking about where else could we put music maybe there's another so yeah you don't always have this kind of situation where a director knows uh, what he or she wants but I think in terms of placement she had a pretty clear idea and another thing that is great she doesn't um, she says something she sticks to her words so she won't go back doesn't mean she'll say oh everything's great and we might do another 20 versions but she won't like change her mind midway which uh, I'm sure some other composers know can be a frustrating experience maybe um, took music from one place and uh, put it in another Actually, I always encourage that and I send uh, stems of the individual tracks so you can have, let's say, melody, bass, drums and pads in individual files that together they will uh, create the stereo I send and I always encourage, that's why I like starting early and uh, accompanying the edit editing phase. So I think some of the n best cues uh, that I've had over the last years were actually placed by the editor in a different place than I might have put it. That's interesting because some composers don't like that. I encourage it. That's great. Um, System Crasher starts with um, a short piece of music and when I saw the film for the first time I thought this is kind of a theme tune for the production company. Can you explain the idea behind the first piece of music in the film? It does have that uh, ring to it uh, because we see all the logos and it's, you know, it's it's a bit, it has a sort of a brand uh, thing going on. But it, the good thing about it, I think, is that it foreshadows Benny's melody later on in the movie. But it was, yeah, I think it was somewhere in between. It was actually one of the hardest cues for me to make for the whole movie because it had, you know, I've, I've worked in sound branding and I sort of didn't feel comfortable doing it. But we needed something there and so the idea was obvious to use the melody and yeah that's how that happened i've got the feeling that the um, score always centers around benny why not use some music 
and the educators discuss what to do with her and then Micha says, okay, I'll take her to my place and why not place their music okay. when they are all talking and maybe we have some dramatic underscore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that would suit the movie. And uh, why not place some music on other characters because it's always with um, Benny, somehow the character. Well, I think the music is mainly, it's between Benny and the people who are close to her. So it's, there's one or two scenes where the music also encompasses her mother and quite a few scenes where it is in dialogue with Misha. Actually, most of the scenes, there's something going on between Benny and Misha and also their different themes combine or their different musical um, let's say colors are combined in several scenes one character Frau Baffany is very important she actually didn't get any music at all but I think that the more sort of fantastic relationship in Benny's life is the one she has with Misha because he's sort of uh, he's like her in a way and he's got he's rough around the edges and she sort of she never says to Frau Baffany I want you to be my mother because she already has a mother that she wants to go to but the father is out of the picture so there is a scene when she says why can't you be my daddy be my daddy and so on and uh, yeah I think you know they're closest so even though there were quite a lot of characters in the movie um, and through the editing process a lot of them I don't think it was absolutely clear from the beginning that Misha's role would be that dominant if I'm not mistaken and I think that we use the music as well to emphasize this where uh, there are some places where you discuss the use of music at all and um, maybe it took some long time and I'm interested um, who won those discussions I don't think there was anything about winning or losing there. Um, there were some things that I found hard to do. Uh, I think like the the childlike lightness of Benny's theme combined with something that has a punk attitude and is, is wild. It's sort of contradictory, so it's hard to make music work, like be a kid's theme and a punk tune at the same time without being annoying, so that took a bit of tweaking to get that right, yeah. I can hear piano, drums, synthesizer in the score, but not brass or warm strings. How did you decide the instrumentation? Well, on the last couple of projects with Nora, um, usually if I know I'm working with a director that is very open, then I will try and suggest a specific sound for the movie that might be coming from the characters or from the era or um, the studio we're in is sort of, it's it's like a field of experimentation for sound and uh, me and also my co-composers here like to see every project as a new opportunity to find a new sound, maybe get a new instrument um, and see if we can, you know, inspire ourselves with something new. So I found for this movie that is bright, you know, Nora's always talking about the colors a lot, they would be bright pink, and um, I never really considered an orchestral sound for this project. How about the drums, the chaotic drums when um, Benny is flipping out? That was one of the very first things I suggested. I told Nora, I know this amazing multi-instrumentalist, uh, John Schröder, a drummer from Berlin, uh, that I've known for, for a while. And um, he has a Benny-like energy when playing instruments. He's an amazing improviser and he can't basically can't stop playing. Like he's, it sounds like he has, you know, four arms. And uh, so I said, yeah, um, and I also told the production, well, we're going to start doing, you know, even before editing started, we're going to record some things with John. So I had a day in the studio with John. I think in the end we just used uh, two or three very short drum passages when Benny starts uh, the first time when she runs away to her mother, later when she runs down the stairs to go in the woods. There's like a very uh, rough, archaic, free sort of drum thing going on. And um, 
yeah so i actually like working that way if i get the chance get ideas during the script then start recording music and also recording musicians already and working with them somewhere between composition and improvisation and experimenting with sound and then giving that into the editing process and helping the movie f you know find its own musical language is there always an advantage in doing improvisation or working like that because in some series for example charity i don't think it would be possible no uh in the series charity that's just a completely different way of working and much more composition based there's basically no improvisation there a part of you know you could say well you know improvising for an hour at the piano and finding chords and melodies you like is also a certain way of improvising to find a composition so i don't really draw the line there or uh, orchestrate what you found and do it with strings maybe for shaiting of course the longest piece of score longer than four minutes is Before the end credits, Benny flees after Micha breaks down the door to the bathroom. Can you talk a bit about the decision to put the longest piece of music there at the end? Why not during the happy moments with Micha in the woods? Well, I think uh, that's kind of the epicenter of the movie and that it's, you know, Benny breaks off with Micha. Their relationship is, you know, It's over, and um, she's barefoot in winter. It's snowing in the woods, and I think it's the the editing takes some time to show the you know day turning into night, and her sleeping there, her being lost and found, and at the same time, maybe what happens in her imagination crawling to this dog house with the dog that is her kind of her enemy and waking up in her mother's arms so the whole scene is as you were saying you know it's it's a realistic movie this scene is not necessarily realistic so it totally made sense to have this as uh one of the the, the main musical cues At first glance, there is not much music in System Crasher, but there are lots of small pieces. How many minutes of score is there in the film? It's roughly half an hour, but uh, as I already said, a lot of the music that I, that I wrote and produced, it was also, I encouraged uh, Nora and, and Stefan Bechinger to cut music off hard, because I think what we decided on together um or i you know, i definitely wasn't opposed uh, to them doing that if you stay in the music for too long you get too much time to contemplate what's happening and to reflect on your emotions and system crash is very fast paced and uh, a lot of people actually can't remember the music after seeing it because they need to see it a second time because it's i think one uh review said it's it's more like a physical experience And I hope that the music was part of uh, that. You talk about the music stopping sometimes abruptly. On the other hand, music is heard extremely quiet in the background for a while. For example, when um, Micha is in the ambulance with uh, Benny and they go to the um, hospital for the first time. And you hear some drones really, really quiet. And then it's becoming loud why i think uh those sounds might trans oh, i think they transport themselves better in in the theater than uh, watching it as a stream but um the idea basically of these sounds is uh to have benny's physical inner t turmoil and um like the rage building in her or this feeling of, of numbness or, or not being able to hear what's going on around. And we used a lot of these sounds that I produced uh, throughout all of the cues that are kind of a musical sound design approach to connect musical themes uh, or, you know, harmonies coming in also in the ambulance just to prepare these. So 
Uh, I think even though a lot of the music goes out with a hard cut, it sometimes come in comes in very you know softly. You often work um, on scores with your studio partner Jan Misere. Why didn't you compose the music together? We did actually work on a couple of tracks together, but uh, we were working on Charité Season 2 with Hannah von Hübenet at the same time. There was also another project, you know, uh, sometimes projects that are supposed to happen in succession. I think Danny Elfman said something about film projects being like icebergs and you're trying to align them into this straight stream and that totally didn't work out last year so um, that's one of the reasons why I ended up also because I've been working on the other projects with with Nora on my own a lot both reasons I think on the other hand you would prefer a collaboration I think generally I have to say um, I, I love working uh, in collaborations on movies. I think the possibilities are larger and it's it can be a pretty nerve-wracking process, even with great directors, uh, deadlines and so on. So, yeah. System Crasher got an award at the Mecklenburg Western Pomerania Film Festival for Best Music and Sound Design. How did you collaborate with sound and sound design? Um, as I said, when we looked at rough cuts, we would go to the studio of uh, Dominik Leube and Oskar Stiebitz, um, also the sound recordist Jonathan Shaw is a very good friend of mine, um, and I also knew the um, Gregor Bonzer who did the mix, so I think Nora had a meeting with the whole sound department months before the shooting and they on their end also had many many concepts also for recording sounds during the shooting so Nora is very aware of s the power of sound and the necessity to plan things ahead. How about the sounds of uh, the ice skating because I think at the end for me it was a mix and I didn't know uh, is the um, sound f from scratching, is it your music or is it sound design? It is actually, it is processed ice skating sounds and we already hear these in the beginning and throughout all of the nightmare sequence as a foreshadowing of this ice skating sequence towards the end, yeah. Were you present during the shooting? No. Uh, would you like Well, I was present with the uh, source music played on the radio and so on, but from afar. Um, the soundtrack for the Steam Crasher will be released uh, this Friday. Why not uh, during the world premiere um, in February at the Berlinale? As I said, uh, we were pretty busy back then and um, yeah, it's it's always more work, you know, to get the cover and the mastering and the track order and yeah, there's, I'm afraid um, soundtracks are extra work that need time and need to be done in peace and quiet. What can you tell us about the release? How much music is on it? How many tracks? Uh, it's 16 tracks, it's uh, 32 minutes and um, I think one or two of the tracks are in the original longer version and as I said this demo is also the first demo I did for the movie is a bonus track. A piece where once a uh, kind of that medium and now there's a renaissance and new soundtracks are being pressed and I think this kind of a hype what do you think about it and why not um, make an LP with a system crusher score? I absolutely love LPs uh, for some reason um, I mean obviously it's always a financial issue um, I was lucky enough I think when we did Above and Below under the Monica Paradox Paradise uh, we won a, a prize for it and we used the prize money to make LPs and the director Nicholas Steiner he traveled the world with the LPs and he always had 10 at each screening and in each Q&A he'd take out an LP and he basically sold almost all 300 which is, which is pretty amazing because I think if you it's a bit late now like the festival tour is over 
or I don't know if it's over, but it's not over, but you know, the film has been, I don't know how many festivals, 30, 40, 50. Um, and yeah, I think you need someone to actually go to each festival and really want to show people the DLP the uh, as uh, Levin, uh, Peter and Elsa Kremser now did with Space Dogs. They came to us and said, hey, we'd really like to do an LP. Are you okay with that? And I said, well, yeah, if you really want to do it, then go ahead. And they told me some wonderful stories as well uh, of, um, you know, selling them on the road and getting really good feedback from people and saying like, because they themselves say they're vinyl lovers and they prefer to buy a vinyl of a soundtrack uh, than to have a Blu-ray of the movie in the shelf. Um, and I can understand because maybe vinyl is such an old format it feels like it's for the ages and the Blu-ray is like hmm well maybe I'm not gonna have a Blu-ray player in five years like with DVDs you know how it is so yeah I, I, I hope I look forward to um, more soundtrack LPs by us and by all, all other composers um, where are you at a Q&A present when the system crasher was shown at a festival or in a cinema? I think I w probably... I can't really remember. I, I think at the Berlinale I was present. Maybe there was one question about music. I can't remember. I wasn't, so um, maybe there would have been a second one. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Um, why isn't there a making off of the score? Well, as with soundtracks, um, I mean, I have a couple of video clips that I'm still going to post also of Andy Haber, the drummer of uh, Northwest, who also play drums, um, and of these little drum robots I used called data machines. But usually, you know, you're busy recording music and you don't have time to make a little clip and get the lighting right and so on so it's it's maybe just a, like a bad phone video it would be an extra production thing coming now to your life story a, a little bit um as a child you learned saxophone and piano why saxophone well i just came home one day and said i wanted to play saxophone and um I don't know. Why? I, I, have you seen a musician? I don't know. In the metro, where did I the idea my come? My mother from? did say there was there was some saxophone player uh, in in uh, Richmond, close to London, where we lived, uh, playing with a hat or something. That might be a reason. Yeah. So it wasn't the parents uh, pushing you to learn an instrument. No, no. I, my mother is very musical, but. Um, It, she definitely didn't say I should learn the saxophone. Why did you study film music and sound design and why at the Film Academy in Baden-Württemberg? I was studying uh, at the University of Arts in Berlin, um, jazz saxophone, and um, sort of wasn't very happy there and was producing music, writing songs, uh, building up a studio and uh, looking you know for other ways to work in music and uh, there was an email from the film academy director benjamin kalme was looking for a miles davis bitches brew type score and i replied and recorded a, a score in, in that style and we got along really well and he said hey um yeah we could really use you over here And on a whim, I applied, uh, and the application was just up. And then it was a very, yeah, it happened within a, a brief period of time. From your first film score to now, um, how much has changed over the years, also from the technical point? Um, well, I mean, I think if you look at Composers like uh, Cristobal Tapia de Ver, who uh, created the score for Utopia, uh, I think he was traveling a lot and he created that score on mainly on his laptop. He did record a lot of things, so I really appreciate that music and I think it's, you know, 
you can produce music in any kind of way and actually for System Crusher because the movie has a certain punk vibe I I used uh, a zoom recorder a lot running around the building even the whistling I just basically put a metronome on the headphone uh, went into our staircase and whistled eight bars there chucked that into Ableton and um, so it's not exactly the absolute high-end production it really depends on the movie that I'm doing sometimes I'll even though we have this studio I'll revert to techniques that I used uh, 10 12 years ago uh, if I want that particular sound so I think you know there's so many different ways of creating sound and there's um, I actually love working in film because I feel like with a film score there's no rule how to achieve your music you know it's great if you can go out and conduct your own orchestra and write all your parts by hand but on the other hand, you know, like in the end, what counts is the music and you don't have to account for for it like if you, you're preparing a performance. Since 2012, you are also a guest lecturer at the university in Baden-Württemberg. What lessons do you teach? I teach um, the film students in the first year. Um, and the idea behind the course which I give in the creative um, filmmaking by Professor Jochen Kuhn who's a filmmaker himself um, it's it's about communication um, with musicians with sound designers and you know like having the courage to actually say I have an opinion and I have a voice and I can voice my own ideas to someone working in music or in sound design instead of with which very often is the case oh I don't really know about that oh you're 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 the professional you know how to do a score I don't really know how to do that I don't think that's that's gonna work very well and uh, I, I really encourage the students to emotionally and intuitively um, describe and then try and get into sound and and I show them a lot of music but also sound design scenes from from different movies um yeah for them to get to know it and to think about it when working on a script thinking about how could i maybe involve sound in my movie like, there's a story but there's also sounds and if, you know look at great directors like hitchcock or Haneke, sound is or uh, also who i appreciate a lot and i show to the students is uh, ruben Oslund from uh, force majeure, majeure and the square the way he uses sound uh is very original and has a great sense of humor and yeah it's quite unique your students um kind of are growing up with a netflix and amazon and how does how does their um, perception to the use of music maybe film is changing from your studying days That quite probably is true, but my studies aren't <laughs> that long ago. <laughs> and I think to them, as to me, like, you know, uh, the classics and uh, the new things are equally relevant. Together with your uh, partner, Jan Miser, you founded the studio Paradox Paradise, where we are in right now. How do you know each other and why did you start your own studio? We met in the first semester again uh, at, at the University of Arts and we were actually into very different kinds of music when we started out but we're very good friends and when I was studying film music it was already like sort of at the film academy there's only four composers each year and hundreds of filmmakers so it's almost like a market situation where you know you can do a lot of projects so I was oversaturated and we were already sharing a studio space together and Jan is kind of mainly a pianist and keyboarder but also a great arranger and like a, just a very talented producer and so yeah we started um, working together. If you work together also with your other colleagues uh, Lars Vogels and Hanna von Übernet, how did you split your work and who decides um, what to do, who's the boss? Um, it really depends who's on the phone with the director 
that's usually the person who kind of calls the shots in terms of what's going to be done and mostly that's me but sometimes it, it will also be Jan or it will be Hannah or it will be Lars depending on the project and um, it's not always you know like 50-50 or uh, three thirds it's it's hard to plan this kind of thing also I'm usually here Jan and Lars also they go on tour a lot so sometimes I'll start a project on my own for two months and then when we go to recording and producing they'll get in you know it really depends there's no rule on how to do it what do you need to start composing um, just a talk with a director like Nora reading the script or is it better maybe to have a visual impression with uh, some scenes from the film if there are no scenes I'll take the script and uh, just uh, you know uh, talking about it uh, if we have that luxury and that time frame very often you know I'll be lucky if I can get in when editing starts or editing has just started to avoid you know use of too much temp um, but yeah I think seeing r just not even I don't actually like seeing an assembly like a four hour assembly so much because that can sort of maybe give you the wrong impression of the film um, but I do like seeing individual scenes to just get an idea for the light and the characters and you know the overall feel. How about um, temp tracks? You said you don't like it so much. I um, I understand it that way. What you just say, um, maybe some for some composers is it's a help to um, see what the director likes or I don't know production people and some others um, don't like it because people fell in, fell in love with the temp score. The worst case scenario uh, for me and I think it's pretty standard um, is well you know they've been editing the movie with temp music for a long period of time and then suddenly okay wow we have a festival in three weeks let's find someone who can replace that so how what's going to happen in that situation anyone can imagine what's going to happen more or less so i'm not necessarily i think when editing starts it's great to create an archive of uh, your own existing music and then music that inspires you generally music that inspires you in terms of the topic or the era in which the movie is shot and then um, to sort of collect your own ideas and find ideas that the director or the editor has and then have like an archive of music that you can fall, fall back on um, and ideally at the same time start composing original music but there won't be an entire score at the beginning of the editing process so you might have to use something else in places um, yeah, Nora was really special that way because she basically just didn't work with any other tracks. Like even, and I think there were one or two situations where I said, "Can't you use a temp there now for the the movie had to go to Berlinale?" And I said, "Like, well, do we really have to have that scene now already?" <laughs> and she's like, "Well, yeah." <laughs> and then you know. And then you do it and sometimes it sticks and uh, some tracks take weeks to finish and others are done in three four hours like the basic the bare bones of it at least you worked also or work still on documentaries what is the bigger challenge for your documentaries or feature films um, I love doing documentaries I think because I've done quite a lot of them uh, I still feel sometimes like feature is even more challenging in some ways but um, it really depends what you want to do for a documentary and who you're working with I think I always like to go into a project and say well can we find you know an edge or something interesting that we can do and uh, for example for one of the, my favorite scores we've done over the last years with Jan Misere and Lars Forges 
is for Above and Below, which we put on vinyl, and there's, I think it's, it's it's basically like a listening album, which you very seldomly have, because it has so many different songs on it and so many different genres. It almost sounds like it's, you know, a soundtrack made up by five or six different artists. So that was definitely a huge challenge, but it was also a lot of fun. You have also um, your own label. Why start one? Um, well, basically nowadays with streaming, I mean, I, I think I remember putting up albums on iTunes before there was Apple Music and people would actually buy it. And uh, then, you know, without asking my permission, <laughs> iTunes turned into Apple Music. So now per stream track, you get like 0.000 something. Yeah, I think uh, also production companies aren't necessarily keen on spending money on making a soundtrack. So it's sort of, you know, uh, we make our soundtracks ourselves at the moment. And I haven't had soundtrack labels coming over and saying, hey, we need to, you know, there's, I think realistically in film, if you look at what you can make with digital streaming nowadays, it's not, it doesn't come into the picture of making any revenue really, which is a shame. So basically, It's a promotional tool for us, for, or just also um, a good way to finish a project and say, okay, this is the score, you can listen to it, yeah. What do you think then about the discussion with copyright about YouTube when somebody puts your music on? Is it for you kind of okay, it's good promo and just uh, let it be or are you behind this and say uh, this is copyright infringement it can't be the second the second thing you said I don't want you know people using my music without permission and also the contracts that I sign as a composer wouldn't agree to that so yeah my last question system crasher is Germany's official submission for the Oscars um, what is your prediction I have none. Uh, I will knock on wood and we'll see. <laughs>